And another great day in this greatest nation on God's green earth. A great day to come to terms with what some have called the new Cold War. There's a book by that title, a book that was prophetic when it was first published uh, six years ago, but uh, has been recently revised and updated. We'll be speaking with the author in just moments. But there are lots of people who say, a new Cold War, don't be ridiculous. Uh, Putin is... uh, Just taking care of business, he's looking after things in Russia, he's no threat to the United States or anyone else. Who is right in this debate? And if there is a new Cold War, uh, how do we go about winning it as we did win the last Cold War? 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. The book that I'm talking about is called The New Cold War, subtitled Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West. You know where Edward Lucas stands. Edward Lucas has covered uh, the end of the First Cold War. He has uh, covered, uh, been based in Moscow for much of his time. He's covered Eastern Europe for The Economist for more than 20 years and witnessed the uh, last Cold War, the parting of the Iron Curtain, and as the Moscow bureau chief covered Boris Yeltsin's reign, and Putin's rise to power. He now lives in London from where he joins us. Mr. Lucas, congratulations on the new edition of your book. Well, thank you very much, and particularly thank you for calling it prophetic. That's a great compliment. Well, it's, it's a, what's obviously the case, because when you were using that term uh, back in 2008, when the book first appeared, uh, there were lots of people who were saying, well, look, uh, Putin respected democratic norms. He stepped down from the presidency after two terms and took the uh, less powerful job as prime minister, putting in his mini me Medvedev as the uh, uh, president. Now he's back. Um, it's a lot tougher for people to say that uh, Putin is a normal European democratic leader, isn't it? Well, that's absolutely right. And I think that over the years, there's been a huge amount of wishful thinking about Russia, and I think it really started back in the 1990s, and I was actually a big critic of the Boris Yeltsin Kremlin as well for many reasons, and I think we saw the beginnings of this very sinister hybrid between organized crime and the old KGB intelligence services right back in those days, and it just got bigger and bigger, and it took over Russia. In a way, Mr. Putin is a symptom of this rather than actually its instigator, but I am pleased now that six years after I wrote the book, seven years after I wrote the book, six years after it was published, that now my analysis has become all this kind of conventional wisdom. And, you know, you know politicians and you know, State Department people are now saying, yes, Russia is a kleptocracy and it's aggressive and we have to deal with it and so on. So that's quite gratifying, but it's still, I don't think, the case that we've really got the measure of what we need to do to deal with this problem. 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. Uh, Your book was attacked, at least the idea of your book, though not by name, in a piece uh, in USA Today uh, by Bob Beckel and Cal Thomas. And uh, the headline is Cold War II, question mark, yet. And um, uh, Bob Beckel writes, Time magazine's recent cover suggesting the possibility of a Cold War II between the U.S. and Russia is irresponsible at best and uninformed at worst. Ouch. And he says, time has taken the incident of the shooting down of the airliner as the principal reason that we are moving toward a new Cold War between the United States, its allies, and Russia. Nothing could be further from the truth. And then he says, uh, when the wall fell, communism was exposed as a failure. Today, the expansion of NATO is extended to the Russian border. The idea that these countries, among them Poland, Hungary, and the Baltic states, could ever return to Russian influence is absurd. Uh, Is Bob Beckel right? No, he's completely wrong, and it's very astonishing and distressing to me to see that people um, can get... I think you have to be a foreign policy expert to get things as wrong as that. (laughs) Um, So, for a start, I think there's a real problem with Russian influence in particularly the Baltic states and other places in Eastern Europe. They're buying politicians, they're buying political parties, they buy media... Um, there's real problems with the even the military security of these countries. So it is actually a problem, whatever Mr. Beckel and his friends say. I think, secondly, just because it's not the same as the old Cold War doesn't mean it's not a problem. And clearly there's no more communism. Putin is actually kind of the worst sort of capitalist. Um, there's an old Russian joke that everything they said about communism was wrong, but everything they said about capitalism was true. 
And so this kind of authoritarian crony capitalism you know, that Mr. Putin and his friends practice is, is really ghastly, and it's certainly not communism. Um, but it is a threat. It's not particularly a global threat to the United States in the way that Soviet communism was. But my goodness, it's a threat inside Europe, as we're seeing right now. It's a threat to Russia's neighbors, as we're seeing right now. And in a way, it's a threat um, to the whole world order, because America is... Um, not on the front foot at the moment. It's uh, you know, under the Obama presidency we've seen the pivot away from allies and a sort of more intro introverted foreign policy. And I think all sorts of countries, Russia among them, are taking advantage of that. One eight hundred nine five five seventeen seventy six. If uh, and and you you're based in London. You've spent many many years covering uh, Russia and the old Soviet Union. Uh, how would you? Uh, analyze the great success of what uh, Secretary Clinton has called a brilliant stroke and in other uh, contexts a master stroke, which was the reset of relations with Putin's Russia. How's that been going? I think it's been a, a, a disaster, really. It was done with some quite good intentions, and I think that whenever you change administration, there's always a chance for a new administration to come in and blame all the problems on the old guys and try and do something new. So as a kind of diplomatic gimmick, I think it was a, it was a re, it was a reasonable idea, um, but it, where it failed very badly was it let down all the allies, and I think even the most ardent proponents of the reset now admit they got that wrong. So whereas they were trying to reach out to Mr. Medvedev, who I never thought, no disrespect to you, and I know your surnames are similar, but you know, you're the good guy, he's the bad guy. Thank you. Um, um, but yeah, he was really just Putin's puppet. There wasn't much daylight between them. And um, in trying to reach out to him and, and placate Russia a bit, they really trod on the toes of loyal American allies, the Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Poles, Czechs, and these countries who really believe in our values and want to be part of our system and have really shed blood for us in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere. And they were having their arms twisted to um, shut up and play nice with the Russians. And I think that was a terrible mistake. And so... On balance, I think you'll find it very hard to find anybody who really defends the reset in the broad sense, although, as I say, in the narrow sense, as a quick sort of diplomatic gimmick, um, maybe it was worth just uh, worth a quick try. The book is called The New Cold War. The author, Edward Lucas, has been one of the most respected reporters in covering Russia and Russian affairs for many years. The, the book is uh, out with a brand-new, fully revised and updated edition it is eminently worth reading. You should check it out at our website at michaelmedved.com. One of the things that was very striking during the Cold War, and particularly its last stages, is you had a, a number of Western leaders, uh, in, including, of course, President Reagan and Prime Minister Thatcher, to some extent even Chancellor Kohl in Germany, who were speaking out against the evil empire. Uh President Obama is not going to be speaking out against much of anything except the evil empire of Republicans that he sees as the greatest threat to humanity. But given the silence and quiescence of President Obama, is there another voice that that could raise the alarm and, and actually give expression to some of the dangers that you elucidate in your book? I think you're right that America is use the Obama administration's phrase leading from behind, it's leading from very far behind in some ways and in a way I think that's right that ultimately as a European I have huge respect and gratitude for what America did for us in two world wars and the Cold War but ultimately the European Union is, is bigger than America, it's got more people, bigger GDP and we should be able to sort out these security problems mainly on our own and we're very grateful for American support and some things that only America can do. But I do think there's something a bit odd about having these enormous economies like Britain, France, Germany, Italy, and so on, um, all unable to deal what is, with what is ultimately a regional security problem. And so I very much hope that Europe is getting its act together now. And I think America, particularly the Congress, has done a very good job in pushing through sanctions on some of Putin's real cronies, the so-called Magnitsky Act of visa bans and asset freezes, and going after some of the inner circle. I think that's great, and I'm very grateful to Congress for that. But we should be, we, in Europe, we should be able to sort this out. And I 
I'm, I'm glad to see that Mrs. Merkel in Germany, Mr. Cameron here, my own Prime Minister, are beginning to talk much more toughly um, about what's going on, because ultimately we are in the front line. We are the people who are are most in danger from this sort of Putin revanchism and attempt to tear up the rules of the European security order. We will be right back with uh, Edward Lucas. His newly uh, revised and re-released book, The New Cold War, is uh, up at our website. Give us a call. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. 1-800-955-1776. That's 1-800-955-1776. MichaelMedved.com. 21 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved show, are we in the midst or in the early stages of a new Cold War? That's what uh, Edward Lucas, our guest, had predicted based upon his more than 20 years experience as a reporter covering the former Soviet Union, uh, what today is the Russian Federation. Uh, Meanwhile, the situation in Ukraine... uh, (laughs) It's it's uh, it's an appalling situation. And one of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Lucas brings up in the latest edition of his book is the relative peep. And that's all it's been about the annexation of Crimea, which is a very significant act on the international stage. The book is called The New Cold War, Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West. Let's go to your calls at 1-800-955-1776. Tom in Glendora, California, you're on the Medved Show with Edward Lucas. Hey, thank you very much, Michael. It's always a pleasure to be on this great show. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lucas, I assume you're British. I think my accent probably gives you a clue on that one. I think it does, sir. And I I would ask you a quick question. Do you think you could arrange a four-for-one trade? We send Obama, Biden, Harry Reid, and Pelosi over to England for David Cameron. (laughs) <laughs> I got nothing against the Brits. I just, anyway, on a serious note, uh, the Ukrainian situation is so frustrating. And of course, it, if we're not in a cold war, it's because by default, of course, we're in a mess, whatever you call it. My three part quick question for you, Mr. Lucas, and I greatly value your opinion. Should not President Obama long ago have condemned Vladimir Putin as the murderous KGB thug that he is? Point two, in light of that, should not President Obama have immediately worked out a deal to arm the brave Ukrainians in the legitimate government in Kiev? Number three, shouldn't Obama have immediately announced we will do all we can to get natural gas and oil over to Europe and Ukraine to try to stave off this monster Putin? Well, I wish you were Secretary of State, sir, because I agree (laughs) with your analysis. Um, I, I think in, in quick succession, yes, um, Putin's KGB background is appalling. This is like having a Gestapo officer or an SS officer as the leader of Germany. But to be fair to President Obama, he's not the only guy who's got this wrong. But the Clintons got this wrong back in the back in the beginning, and the George Bush administration's got it wrong. George Bush looked into his eyes and got a sense of his soul, where he should have looked into his eyes and seen the three letters K, G, and B. Um, so I think you know, I, I, I think a lot of Western leaders have, have been played by wishful thinking on this. Yes, we should be arming the Ukrainians, but we should also be very careful because this Ukrainian leadership is pretty um, contaminated by the corruption and, in, and incompetence of the past. We need urgently, we need elections in Ukraine, parliamentary elections, and we need to reboot the political system there on the basis of the rule of law and proper democracy and so on, and get away from this oligarchic capitalism which has plagued them. But I think your third point is absolutely vital. The most important thing America could do would be to liberalize the export of oil and natural gas, because those are really Russia's big weapons. It's not the army and the navy. It's not the rusty nukes and the creaky spy satellites. Their really big weapons are their natural resources, and particularly oil and gas, which have some parts of Europe in a chokehold. And if we could get American um, oil and gas on the high seas sailing over to Europe and competing with this uh, with this Russian oil and gas, natural gas, that would be a really great move. So I enti- entirely endorse your, your views on that. Uh, well, one of the things, and this is something where I honestly do not know the answer, but uh, just a few months ago, really, the administration had drawn a 
red line in the sand and uh, had said that uh, we were going to take strong action to respond to the use of chemical weapons by the murderous Assad regime in Syria. I mean, murderous and to the extent of 175,000 minimum uh, dead civilians. So, okay, uh, we didn't do anything. We outsourced that to Vladimir Putin, and he was going to take responsibility for working with his friends in Syria in getting rid of the chemical weapons. I do not know the answer to this. How is that all going? Well, I think that it was your president, Teddy Roosevelt, who said that the secret of foreign policy was to speak softly and carry a big stick. And I'm afraid that the Obama administration's got this the wrong way around, and they um, express grave concern and draw red lines and so on, but they don't carry, they carry a very small stick. And I think that we've, um, we had a chance in Syria to have a toppling of the Assad regime with people who basically believed in our values. We didn't help them, and now they've been pushed out of the way by people who hate us. And that's a terrible outcome. On the chemical weapons, yes, the um, Russian brokered deal has led to the destruction of a lot of the Assad regime's chemical weapons, and that's good. Um, but they've still got more. We're still seeing um, isolated instances of, of those being um, used against the rebels. So I think it'd be very hard to look at the Syrian um, history of the last 18 months or two years and say this was a triumph. And it's actually exactly what Putin wants. He likes to say that it's, it's a choice between me and al-Qaeda. Which do you want? And then, of course, we choose him. And, he's, yeah, and, and that's what he's done in Syria. He's made it into a choice between the Assad regime, which is basically a sort of Putinist-type regime, or these crazy people who want to just you know, murder and kill and destroy everything the West stands for. And so it's a great outcome from his point of view and a very bad one from ours. Okay, there's a there's a new uh, social media campaign that has been launched by Dmitry Rogozin, who apparently is the deputy prime minister in in Russia, and uh, he uh, posted a, a tweet that uh, or he tweeted a photograph of um, President Putin uh, with a leopard on his lap, a very ferocious looking leopard, next to a picture of um, President Obama holding a little fluffy toy poodle. And both photographs are genuine, but the impression was that one is a, a a manly, tough, serious leader, and the other, well, the other is Barack Obama. And uh, what do you say to those American conservatives? And there are a surprising number of them who may understand some of the dangers of Russia, but seem to feel this lingering admiration for Vladimir Putin. Well, I think you always have to be very careful that distaste for your own leaders doesn't blind you to the faults of other countries' leaders. Amen. And I, um, and I was amused by your um, caller who wanted to send over um, Nancy Pelosi and various other politicians to um, us in exchange for David Cameron. I have to say there's quite a few people in this country who'd like to export David Cameron to anyone who'd take him. Um, so I, I think one has to be a bit careful about these, these comparisons. I also think that it's quite remarkable that Putin is indulges in this sort of macho um, posturing, which in many political cultures would be absurd. I mean, most democratic leaders don't feel the need to take their shirts off. And Mussolini the did. ...and show their muscles to pose with various wild animals and with all sorts of <laughs> machinery and weapons and so on. And maybe, a, maybe, maybe Mitt Romney could try that. Uh, if you can stay with us, Mr. Lucas, the book is called The New Cold War... Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West. We're speaking to Edward Lucas. Uh, the book has just been re-released and revised. Uh, more of your calls coming up on the new Cold War. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. That's 1-800-955-1776. Michael Medved Show, 1-800-955-1776. That's 1-800-955-1776. MichaelMedved.com. 34 minutes after the hour. If you talk to most Americans who have even heard of Vladimir Putin, and given the fact that uh, there are apparently about 30% of Americans who don't know who our vice president is, um, even with his revelations of enjoying swimming in Vladimir Putin-like circumstances. And if people don't know what I mean, uh, 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 Vice President Biden recently confessed that he liked to go commando, uh, I, I think is uh, the the way that that's described. 
Yeah, and we have the uh, the author of those revelations um, who <laughs> talks, uh, who has spoken to some of the vice presidential security detail um, tomorrow on our show. But today we have Edward Lucas, the author of the new Cold War. Like President Bush, he has looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes. Unlike President Bush, he's seen something other than um, a, uh, a a lover of uh, peace and international harmony. Uh, the subtitle of the book is Putin's Russia and the Threat to the West. Let's go to uh, Dan in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Dan, you're on the Michael Medved Show with Edward Lucas. Yes. Speaking of historic amnesia, I was just wondering... Um, in 1948, they had the Berlin airlift, and I'm just wondering, instead of just trying to keep Berlin the uh, open, if the United States has to, will be able to have to keep Europe open in a cold, hard winter. And um, you mean if, if with with uh, with uh, Putin cutting off potentially natural gas or oil supplies? That's his club, and he's going to use it because he's used it before. Edward Lucas. Well, I used to live in Berlin, and one of the great stories of the Berlin airlift was when the um, General Clay said to the commander of the U.S. Air Force in Europe, I need you to fly coal to Berlin. And he said, you want us to freight coal to Berlin? He said, yes, I want you to freight coal to Berlin. And the U.S. Air Force did fly coal to Berlin. It kept the Berliners from freezing during that winter. And I think by the standards of, of, of that sort of titanic feat, um, putting oil onto tankers and um, putting liquefied natural gas onto tankers and sending it to Europe is much less difficult. And so I really hope that the United States will liberalize its energy exports. And I think that Europe does have, in the sort of medium term, a severe problem with energy. We've, in the very short term, we're fine because it's been a mild winter. We have plenty of natural gas in storage. We have and we've done quite a bit to um, improve our short-term resilience. And on a kind of five-year horizon, we're, we're probably okay as well. But between three months and five years is pretty tricky. And so we're going to have to pay a price. If, if Russia wants to turn the natural gas off and the, the oil and the coal, um, it'll hurt them and it will hurt us. And I'm not sure, really, that European leaders who learnt belatedly to talk tough to Putin over his revanchist policies whether they're really willing to take um, the hits when it comes to the things that Russia can do to hurt us. Let's go to uh, Tim Marysville, Washington. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Edward Lucas. Yes, hello, Mr. Medved, and hello, Mr. Lucas. Um, I think uh, Mr. Putin is uh, very much aware of what happened over in Kosovo and where we didn't uh, follow the rule of international law there uh, under you know, what happened to Serbia. And also Russia is very much uh, well aware of... Uh, what happened in uh, World War II, 15% of the Russian population was uh, killed off. And uh, what, so, what, what rule of international law did you think we disregarded in Kosovo, Tim? Uh, yes, uh, there's a ruling uh, that was uh, made in July 22nd, 2010. No general prohibition may be inferred from the practice of the Security Council with regard to declarations of independence and international law contains no prohibition or de on declaration. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly you mean. Um, uh, Edward Lucas. Can I just help out here? This is just kind of legal nitpicking. And um, for a start, your facts are wrong, sir. It wasn't 15% of the Russians. It was 15% of the Soviet population. By far the biggest casualties in World War II were not Russians. They were Ukrainians and Belarusians. Most of the fighting in World War II did mm. not happen on Russian territory. It happened on the territory of what's now Belarus and the now Ukraine. And the way the Russians have appropriated World War II and made it into their narrative of their suffering and the destruction of their country is just really part of Stalinist myth-making. If we're going to pay respects to anybody about World War II, let's pay it to the people who actually suffered and not the people who've, uh, who've claimed the suffering. And on Kosovo, you know, I know Kosovo. I've spent a lot of time in former Yugoslavia. The Kosovans were subject to a kind of astonishing, systematic ethnic cleansing and repression from the Serbs. Okay, so how, how do you uh, respond appropriately to that? And what about Putin's role regarding Iran and the threat of a nuclear Iran? And on Middle East and the ongoing terror threat, we'll talk about that and more with Edward Lucas in London coming up. 1-800-955-1776. The Michael Medved Show. 
44 minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, speaking with uh, Edward Lucas, who is the author of The New Cold War, which has been fully revised and updated and re-released in paperback. It is a must-read for anybody who cares about the future of Europe and the future of the United States of America, because as much as we would like to ignore the rest of the world, uh, it uh, won't ignore us. 1-800-955-1776 1-800-955-1776 is our phone number. Uh, Mr. Lucas, one of the things that has been striking in the recent Middle East crisis is the Iranian supreme leader, uh, the Ayatollah Khamenei, has uh, said that uh, his plan is to uh, arm uh, with rockets and uh, other missiles uh, Palestinian freedom fighters in the West Bank who currently are not armed, so they can do some of the same wonderful work that Hamas has been able to achieve. It highlights why these ongoing nuclear negotiations um, are so very important. What is there any constructive role that uh, Putin has been able to play, or any role at all, regarding what... Uh, we used to view as a very serious threat in this country, which is the threat of a nuclear-armed Iran. Well, it still is a very serious threat, and it's it's one of the funny things about international diplomacy is that we all concentrate on the crisis that we can see, and then we um, don't look at the crisis that's coming around the corner. And I think that the Iranian nuclear program is one of those things that is still um, is a tick-tock in the background. I must say, if if I was um, a Palestinian on the West Bank, um, I wouldn't think, gosh, those guys in Gaza are having a great time. I wish we had some rockets and we could live the kind of life that they do. Um, And I think the idea that there's a sort of Palestinian freedom fighters um, aching to get Iranian missiles is is a bit of a um, loose use of, 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 of terminology, really. And I think that the you know, thing we always, we always need to bear in mind is that there's a lot of Arabs living in Israel who are full citizens of, of Israeli society and are able to practice their religion and vote and enjoy all sorts of freedoms in a way that no Arabs anywhere else in the Arab world are able to do. But don't, wor- don't worry, though, because the um, Hamas just uh, announced that uh, their missiles um, and rockets only hit Jews. They, we say to Israeli Arabs living in Haifa, Jaffa, uh, Accra, uh, Lod, Ramla, and the Negev, the rockets fired by the Al Qassam brigades will not hit you. Uh, we know these parts. We're familiar with the geography and with history. Not a single Arab Palestinian child will be hit by one of our missiles. Um, and this, despite the fact that there are about 300 examples so far of rockets uh, that have yeah. have struck Arab Israelis. Um, <laughs> It's, well, but... it's, 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 kind, it's kind of weird when you, I mean, I can think of previous political regimes who've said it's okay, we're only killing Jews. And um, I, I find the whole thing quite bizarre. And I would re- strongly recommend to all your listeners, if you're trying to make sense of this from an Israeli point of view, just read the Hamas Charter. It's the only political document which manages to be nasty both about Jews and Freemasons and Rotarians. <laughs> it's really a bizarre sort of conspiracy um, document. It's, um, it's absolutely crazy. Do you, do you um, know who, we, else, who else was obsessed with Freemasons and Jews, though not yeah. Rotarians? Adolf Hitler. Yeah, well, I, so I think you, you, you want to ha- I mean, I, I, I have enormous sympathy for, for, for Israel in this. You're up against people who are devoted to the destruction of your country and your own sort of personal destruction. But I also think if I was an Israeli, I'd be very worried because I think they're kind of winning the battle but losing the war. And opinion is shifting all over the world, um, rightly or wrongly, against them. And this idea that you just come in every five years and, as they put it, mow the grass um, and you know, beat up Hamas for a bit and demoralize them and um, you know, give them and you buy yourself some more time... I don't think I don't think this is working. I'm not sure I know what the answer is, but I, I, if 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 I, and as a friend of Israel, I'm worried. If I was an Israeli, I'd be even more worried. Let's go to uh, Joe in Long Beach, California. Joe, you're on the Michael Medved show with Edward Lucas. Mike, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Well, listen. Uh, I hear all of the uh, the simpletons on uh, talk radio and on the TV shows uh, speaking of the weakness of the uh, president in regards of. Uh, 
you know, um, trying to uh, provide solutions in the Middle East and in the Ukraine. The bottom line, you may not like it, but uh, whatever those solutions are, they're going to involve the Russians, and they're also going to involve the Iranians. So to, uh, to say that the president is uh, uh, weak and that uh, he's uh, responsible for these things uh, uh, dragging on is uh, totally incorrect and reeks of just uh, partisanship, Michael. Now, uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joe to... so wait, hold on for a moment. Do, do you think that American foreign policy is going well? Michael, given the state of the world, given the fact that we are dependent on uh, people that we may not like, uh, solutions are not easy. They're not just uh, us going over there with the, uh, the hammer and uh, deciding how we want to. Right. Yeah, you'll things. notice you're not answering my question. Do you think American foreign policy is going well? It is going as well as it possibly can uh, at this time. We're okay, not let's, sending any uh, let, American soldiers. Let's let's try to it. let's try to get a response from Edward Lucas. Do you agree well, that I, American? I find that astonishing because I mean I talk to people even inside the administration and they're not as optimistic um, as 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 you're putting out. And, and I I think that it's it, 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 of course foreign policy is difficult. And I would I, I always point out we never had a golden age, you know, even in in the 80s with Ronald Reagan, who I remember very fond- fondly as a great warrior for, for freedom, there was terrible foreign policy mistakes made, made then. So you always have a lot of mistakes, and it's always very difficult. But I do think that this administration has a kind of blind spot when it comes to allies. And it's very interesting, if you look at their rhetoric, they love talking about partners, and they hate talking about allies. And I think that um, President Obama particularly has this sort of cool professorial idea about foreign policy that it's uh, it's a kind of calm rational thing and you just um, play the cards you've got as best you've got and actually it's not it's ultimately it's more like a marriage it's about people who really care about america who really believe in the atlantic alliance who sent their sons and daughters off to iraq and afghanistan and other places to die in what ultimately american war was not their war we will be right back with edward lucas his book the new cold war the greatest show on God's green earth. Uh, whatever. The Michael Medved Show. Fifty-five minutes after the hour on the Michael Medved Show, speaking about the excellent uh, new, newly released, revised, and updated version of the book uh, "The New Cold War" by Edward Lucas. With Edward Lucas, it is a, uh, a book that should open people's eyes to some of the stakes involved with facing down uh, Vladimir Putin and dealing with some of the international challenges that most Americans prefer to ignore, though there is a broad recognition that no, things are not going well at all. Uh, let us go to uh, Rob in uh, Seattle, Washington. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Edward Lucas. Yes, good afternoon. Hey. I was wondering, <clears throat> if we had put our missiles into Poland and Czechoslovakia, wouldn't that have sent a stronger message? And why don't we talk to the Poles and the Czechs about putting missiles into their uh, countries? That, that was about, they were defensive missiles. They were ABMs, weren't they, uh, Mr. Lucas? That's right. This was actually defensive missiles against an Iranian threat. If you look at the map, if you draw a line from Iran to the United States, it goes over... Um, Poland and, uh, and the Czech Republic. Um, but the Russians got very annoyed about this, and the American administration, Mr. Obama, pulled the rug from underneath the Atlanticists in Poland and the Czech Republic and cancelled those plans, which went down very badly. They're now putting, uh, they've got a new and potentially better um, missile defense plan um, involving the Aegis uh, ships and eventually some land-based sta- um, stations. But people are pretty skeptical. People feel that they, they, they're not quite sure they trust the American government anymore. And I think what we really need in Poland is um, an American military base. We should have an American command headquarters there, and we should have some American troops and a rapid reaction force that would be able to deter Russia um, from attacking the Baltic states, and that's the most dangerous thing we're facing at the moment, is a military kind of Baltic missile crisis. Let's go to uh, Steve in Reno, Nevada. You're on the Michael Medved Show with Edward Lucas. Hi, gentlemen. I just wanted to make uh, two quick points. One, I haven't, uh, I don't understand why the same people who are calling the Israelis war criminals uh, for warning people before they uh, bomb them 
Uh, why aren't they calling Barack Obama a war criminal for using drone strikes to hit targets in cafes that kill civilians? Why, why is that, Mr. President? Why is that acceptable? Okay, the other point, unexpl- quickly. The- and the, yeah, the second point is, um, why is nobody bringing up that it's a war crime to hide weapons caches amongst the civilian population well, and actually, the civilian target? Well, actually, thank God, Israeli spokespeople do bring that up. Last word, Edward Lucas. Well, I'd be very careful of this sort of kind of moral equivalence of this is bad, so why isn't this bad? And I think just look look at things on on their merits. And I think that drone strikes are not qualitatively different from dropping high explosives from from bombers. It's war is a horrible thing; it always has horrible effects. But in the end, you have to ask what the political reason behind the war is. And I I have great sympathy for the um, Israelis. Um, desire to defend themselves, although, as I say, I feel they're winning the battle but losing the war. Well, let's hope you're wrong on that for the sake of Israel and this greatest nation on God's green earth.